you know, oftentimes in our lives, we kind of can get a little bit upset and frustrated and even angry about the things that life has dealt us, the hand that it's dealt us, whether it comes from the universe in our minds, from God, whatever that happens to be. And so often we find that that can affect us so deeply in a negative way. And yet there are those that have been dealt perhaps even a worse hand than we have received that have turned that around and have affected lives in such a positive way. And an example of that is what we're going to talk about today. I'm really grateful to have Dr. Steve Gardner on the show with us today. He has written a book called Jabberwocky, Lessons of Love from a Boy Who Never Spoke. And he talks about the experiences he had with his son, who literally was disabled in unimaginable ways. And yet by going to Jabberwocky camp and experiencing an inclusion and a life of adventure, a life of love, a life of laughter, made all the difference for him, made all the difference for Dr. Gardner and his wife, and has made all the difference for many people surrounded in that area who have been able to experience that community. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Gardner on the show with us today. Um, I look forward to having you join us and hope that you'll enjoy it. At the end of the day, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. It's about what you've done with those accomplishments. It's about who you've lifted up, who you've made better. It's about what you've given back. Denzel Washington. Welcome to Inspire Vision. Our sole purpose is to elevate the lives of others and to inspire you to do the same. Dr. Stephen Gardner, how are you doing? Just right, Doug. Nice to meet you today. Hey, it's great to have you on the show. You, you have quite a story. And as you and I talked just briefly before we started the interview, um, you know, I think at this point in time, it's such a powerful story and something that's so desperately needed within our community uh, at this point in time. So I'd love for you to kind of share your background, because that's, I think, important. And then let's talk about your story. Well, uh... My son was born with cerebral palsy, our, our only child. And uh, he, was, he was unable to talk, he was unable to walk. He needed help with everything. Uh, so at first, you know, as, as first time parents, obviously that was distressing and upsetting um, and troubling. But as time went on, we realized that there was something very special about this boy. Even though he couldn't speak, uh, he had within him some sort of goodness and love and compassion that seemed to be just sensed by all the people around him. As he got a little bit older, we discovered that there was a place on the island of Martha's Vineyard called Camp Jabberwocky, which was the first sleepover camp for kids with serious disabilities like Graham, having started way back in the 1950s, you know, long before the ADA and long before the role of people with disabilities in society was really welcomed. Um, so we went down there about 25 years ago, Graham as a camper, and I rode his coattails in there because they needed a camp doc, and I was a primary care doc in Boston. And we discovered this place in which um, people embrace each other's differences. People look at one another with open hearts and open minds, and they laugh a lot. They, they celebrate the value of laughter. In fact, they, there's an expression there that says, uh, we take our silliness very seriously at Camp Jabberwock. So we, we were lucky enough to be embraced into this community of special people, both the campers and their helpers, the volunteers. And for 13 summers, we went there and we spent time there having adventures with these people and learning that we could do a lot of things that we might not have expected, like kayaking, even windsurfing with a chair on windsurfer, uh, participating in uh, arts and crafts and theater and stuff like that. So this place um, reminded me of, of uh, what Mr. Rogers said, Mr. Rogers being one of my favorite philosophers, he said that um, the one thing that really changes the world 
is when one person gets the idea that love can abound and be shared. And so we stumbled into such a place. And I think the founder, Mrs. Lamb, nicknamed Hellcat, for her determination and also her strange driving habits, um, she would have added to, to what Mr. Rogers said, probably the word laughter. That laughter is maybe another thing that can change the world if it can abound and be shared. So we were lucky enough to be together there for 13 years, meeting all kinds of people with, with and without disabilities. And in fact, the, the ethos there is that we all have abilities and disabilities. Those of us like me who look able-bodied may have sort of hidden disabilities, maybe some PTSD or who knows what. But the notion there is that every one of us in that community has something to contribute. The notion is that every one of us in that community is an equal. So we don't really think of ourselves as, as two groups of people, the campers who need help and the volunteers who give help. We think of it as a community in which everybody contributes whatever they can. And in that place, we experience what the writer Marina Keegan called the opposite of loneliness a feeling of belonging to something greater than ourselves, a feeling of being in a place where even though we might argue at times, we might disagree at times, at the end of the day, we know that everybody cares deeply about every, everyone else. Um, we know that, that diversity is truly celebrated there. Inclusion is truly embraced there. And this feeling of deep caring about one another really is described most accurately in the, by the term Jabberwocky love. So for 13 years, we had that together. Unfortunately, Graham had a complication of cerebral palsy, which was epilepsy. And he had a particularly nasty seizure one day while we were swimming and he passed away at age 22. After that, his mom and I, his mom also was a volunteer there as a cook. And by the way, cooking for 80 people isn't the easiest thing. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> There's a lot involved in that. Uh, yeah. So, so we had to make a tough decision. Should we go back to camp as volunteers, knowing we we're going to miss this boy intensely, knowing that we we're going to be, you know, there, there was going to be melancholy involved, but also knowing that this Jabberwocky love and laughter was going to fill our hearts during a time of really unspeakable grief. So that's what we did. Uh, and I've been going back there for the last 10 years without Graham, uh, including this summer, which is the first post pandemic summer. So we missed last year, first time in 68 years that there was wow. no um, So it's a story about Graham's legacy of love. It's a story about people who have open hearts and open minds, even though they're very different from each other. They're not afraid of each other's differences in fact, they, I'll say they embrace each other's differences. And in the end, they become a community, they become a family. And I feel extremely blessed, extremely lucky to have stumbled into that place. Um, the one thought we have when we leave the island after our session there is, why can't the rest of the world be more like Camp Jabberwocky? You know, you, you talk about disabilities and you talk about the fact and the reality, and I think you hit a really good point, um, is that we all have disabilities. One way or the other, we all have disability. You talk about PTSD, you know, we, we have all of these disabilities of imprints and, and experiences in our past life that are affecting us. Uh, and, and I think sometimes we don't realize that and and willing to admit that you know what we all have disabilities so how do we turn that around i love i love the fact that you're talking about how important love is inclusion is uh diversity is and so forth and obviously what you were experiencing there at jabberwocky was intense and probably more descriptive than we would see in general, but I really appreciate you wanting to go into this next area of the world around us uh, and what on earth is going on and what are some of the lessons that we can learn 
from your experience and your son's experience and your wife's experience? Well, um, you know, I think at that camp, it's hard to go, it's hard to be there even for, you know, one minute without feeling that you've been changed forever. Um, for example, the, the very first time I went down there, uh, even though I'd been a doc for quite a while and surrounded by lovely people, compassionate nurses and therapists and doctors, uh, and I was familiar with those people and how beautiful that is, people who give. But when I went to Jabberwocky, I, I think the very first day I watched a 15 year old girl uh, who was sort of a camp intern, a, a counselor intern, taking care of a middle-aged man who was completely disabled with a smile on her face, laughing. And she was able to do some tough stuff like di diapering, uh, toileting, um, bathing. And I scratched my head and I wondered, how does somebody get to be like that at such a young age? And I uh, decided that it was probably because she had seen other people behaving like that, specifically her older sister, who was one of the more senior counselors, a lovely brainiac, but heart of gold woman. Uh, and this young gal wanted to be more like her sister. And so she became more like her sister. And um, so being around those people really caused me to scratch my head and think about how we become who we are. And I think if we, if we see that kind of compassion and goodness and laughter and fun growing up, it's much easier for us to become those kinds of people. If we but we don't, yeah, we don't really see that around us a lot. I mean, right. Quite honestly, that that is probably a unique experience that most of us never have. I mean, if we see the opposite, unfortunately, we were more likely to become like the opposite. Uh, people who are suspicious of one another, people who don't like differences. Um, so, yeah, Jabberwocky is a very small enclave. Forgive me, there's a garbage truck going by okay. right now. <laughs> Um, sorry about the noise. But so yeah, Jabberwocky is a small enclave on a small island in New England. And um, how, is it possible that a small place can really change a world full of 7 billion people? Probably not. But we also believe that there is a ripple effect when we leave the island, that we can carry within us a nugget of that ethos and share it with the people that we interact with when we go home. Uh, the sort of the butterfly effect. Yes. That a butterfly can flap its wings in New Zealand and somehow perturb the, the air currents in California or something like that. So, so we have the hope that even a small place like Jabberwocky has the potential to make the world a little bit better place. Well, and you know, obviously you have learned some extraordinary lessons and and you know I, I love the fact that you've written the book you know Jabberwocky and and talking about your experience your son's experiences your wife's experiences what are some of those key elements and lessons that you learned with your experiences there working with these children, working with these individuals, because as you say, there were a number of older individuals there. What were some of the key lessons that you've learned that you're sharing in the book that could be so applicable to us today? That's such a great question. Um, you know, when, when Graham was sick, uh, when he was about 10 years old, he was in Children's Hospital in Boston and, and nearly died. Um, and we read a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold Kushner. And in the book, he talks about uh, whether or not God can be both good and omnipotent. And he concludes that uh, it's not possible for God to be both. Um, God can be good, but not omnipotent. So when bad things happen to good people, um, when people are born with a disability or they acquire a disability, it's not because God wants that to happen, but God's presence can be felt in the love of people around that individual when something, some adversity happens. 
And we all experience adversity, obviously, in lifetimes sooner or later. Yes. And we probably all have this sort of existential question of, you know, why, why did that happen to someone that I love? Um, I had a patient around that time when Graham was sick uh, who was studying theology, and I, I hit him with Rabbi Krishner's conundrum. Um, and he thought about it, and I thought about it. And a little later, he sent me a note, and it said, Dear Dr. Gardner, I believe that when Graham got sick, or later when Graham passed away, God was the first one to cry. God was the first one to cry. You know, God is here in the goodness around us. God wants us to support one another. But God has nothing to do with these ra seemingly random developments where somebody's born with cerebral palsy or somebody gets, uh, gets in an accident or is injured in some way. Uh, so I think you know, the lesson from that is, is back where we started. It's about love. It's about how we can all uh, love one another no matter what's happened to somebody. Uh, well, many, of the, many of the campers can't even talk. Um, they're nonverbal. And yet we can feel love from them through their eyes, through their gestures, just through their being. And we can give it right back to them. Uh, and those are sort of invisible lines of connection that, that, that produce humanity. And so yes. I guess that answers your question, but that's a convoluted way of trying to answer your question. Well, it does. And, and you know, as you were talking about that letter you, you got, I was thinking, in my mind, the first thing that happened when Graham passed away is God was there to wrap his arms around him on the other side and say, welcome home. And, and you know, I, I think that you, you have such an important point here that we can learn lessons from people who have experienced such adversity, and if you want to call it adversity in their lives, and yet as you see them coming together, particularly here at Jabberwocky and laughing and loving, I, you know, the sense of laughter, the sense of loving each other. And, you know, you, you talk about the fact that oftentimes, you know, your son never could speak, could he? Never did. Okay. And yet the question is, what type of effect did he have on those around him without any type of verbal capabilities so yeah, he communicated i think primarily doug through his eyes and he had these beautiful hazel eyes um, and you could just feel you could just feel the emotions coming from him uh, a great way of, of articulating that comes from winnie the pooh actually okay <laughs> so uh, piglet piglet one day said to winnie the pooh hey how do you spell love? And Pooh said, we don't spell love, we feel it. And I think that kind of sums it up. If you were around, if you were in Graham's presence, you felt love, you felt goodness, you felt joy. Uh, he didn't have to articulate it in words, but it was an energy, sort of an ethereal quality that came, came from inside of him. So, you know, what comes to my mind is, I know that there are those that experience any degree of adversity, certainly not to the degree that Graham did. But when that adversity comes into their lives, they're angry, they're, they're frustrated, they're resentful. How on earth were you able to help Graham? Or did it come innately from him to avoid that sense of anger and frustration and resentment that why did this happen to me? to a sense, as you say, that where he just really exhibited and exuded love and kindness. Yeah. I'll just quickly tell you and your audience a story about fourth grade. Uh, we decided to put Graham into uh, an inclusion class where he was with other you know, able-bodied kids. And his teacher came up with an idea called the designated driver. Uh, in which she would assign another uh, child each day to push Graham in his wheelchair to all the activities at school, so to assembly and recess, wherever they might go. And his mom and I were a little apprehensive about that at first. We wondered if they might there might be some resentment, or maybe the parents might think it was awkward, some of the teachers. But it turned out 
that the designated driver became a coveted role for his, his peers in fourth grade. These kids understood intuitively, just from, from being around Graham, that there was a joy in assisting another person, that it was uplifting to include a person like Graham in everything they did. And so the fact that these sort of charismatic, cool kids in his classroom embraced him from the very beginning opened Cynthia's in my eyes. And we realized that young people don't intuitively uh, worry about differences. They, they don't intuitively um, resent people who are different. In fact, quite the opposite. They seemed willing to um, embrace him and include him from the beginning. And a lot of that did have to do with his own charisma, his own special qualities that we've been talking about. So once Cynthia and I realized that he was impacting people in that way, what might have seemed like a very negative, frightening experience turned around into actually a very positive, uplifting experience. And I, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that he changed the whole school on some level. He was the first guy to be, first seriously disabled kid to be brought into a full inclusion classroom. Um, and I think he, he literally uh, enriched that whole school. Wow. And, and you know, you, you talk about that. And I think so often we don't realize that just as a single individual, the impact that you can have, you talk about the butterfly effect, which I, I love that concept, but the fact that here he is disabled, can't talk, and yet his spirit and who he was brought about such a sense of love and kindness and inclusion throughout his entire school. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 and even beyond throughout the rest of his, his life, uh, it was that way. So how do we apply that to today? Well, um, I would say it's, it's as simple as this. I think we ourselves need to try to regard the people we meet in life with open hearts and open minds, the same way the Jabberwocky campers look at us when we're down on Martha's Vineyard. Um, if we can have open hearts and open minds, it's possible to embrace people who are different from us and not resent them and not hate them and not create the kind of dissonance that exists in the world right now. That's easily said, maybe not, <laughs> not, not easily done. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, if you spend a little time at Jabberwocky, it's, it's easier to do that when you leave the island and you, you go back to your normal life because you contain a nugget of that experience in you and, and you know how good it feels when you can behave that way. Well, and the effect that the community had in Jabberwocky, yeah. I, I think that that becomes an important point because how, and again, you know, you talk about laughter, you talk about love, you talk about just inclusion in that small community compared to, you know, what we have around us. Uh, and yet, how, how important do you think that can be? And how do we apply that? I mean, let's honestly talk. How do we apply that based on your experience and seeing this into our real world here where we are experiencing the things that we're experiencing right now? as far as the anger and the frustration and, and all of that? That's a tough one. I wish I was smart enough to answer that particularly. <laughs> um, I, I can go back to the very beginning of Jabberwocky, which was 1953. And Mrs. Lamb was a speech therapist in a, a, a factory town called Fall River, Massachusetts. And she was visiting kids like Graham uh, and helping them with speech. And typically in the summer, she'd visit them in the darkened parlors of their family's houses. And it ticked her off that they never went to the beach. Many of them never saw the light of day. So she got the idea of taking them over to a, a place and beginning a camp uh, for people with kids with disabilities. So she, she picked Martha's Vineyard, I'm not sure exactly why. But when she, she arrived there initially with three children in wheelchairs, a young helper, very little money, and only a sort of a vague plan of what was, how this was gonna play out when she got there, 
I think a church had offered her a cabin to stay in. But in her heart, she had the conviction that if she showed up there with those kids, that the community would embrace them. It wasn't a scientific conviction. She had no knowledge basis for this. She just had a belief that that would happen. And in fact, from the very first day, the community of Martha's Vineyard embraced her dream, embraced her, embraced those children. One of the children was quoted as saying, wow, all we have to do is think of what we might need. And the next day it's there on the doorstep. So that community uh, got, got what she was driving at. They understood it seemingly from the beginning. They embraced the idea that Jabberwocky would make their community more inclusive, sillier, more whimsical, more playful, more fun, um, more loving, a, a more complete community. After all, Jab uh, the vineyard is a place where there are a lot of folks uh, who, are, who are, have deep pockets yeah. and they're, and they're well-to-do uh, and there, there are some enclaves there of yacht clubs and all that kind of stuff. But those people grasped the idea of what Mrs. Lamb was trying to get going there. Um, and so th I guess the question is why, why couldn't the rest of the world or the rest of the country em embrace the same notion the way uh, the community of Martha's Vineyard did? And maybe it's just that they haven't seen enough of it. You know, maybe, this, maybe it's just that a lot of the world, a lot of uh, even the United States uh, has never seen an example like Mrs. Lamb and Camp Jabberwocky and Graham uh, to draw from. Yeah, and and you know it's interesting when you when you talk about that that we've never experienced it, and you know what's interesting is once you've experienced it, that changes your whole life, and all of a sudden you become an advocate for that type of experience and that type of community. Now, yeah. with your with your book, you know it's like lessons of love, you know, from a boy who never spoke. Um, what are some of those lessons? I'd, I'd love for you to share with the audience a few of those lessons that you've written in the book uh, that perhaps we can touch the lives of some people that are listening. Uh, there's one story about uh, the yurt that we have at, at Jabberwocky. Uh, and some of your viewers and listeners may know what a yurt is. It's a round building um, that was, originally was designed by nomads in the Far East to deflect wind, I think. But at Jabberwocky, we have a yurt that's used for uh, dance and sometimes for meditative activities. Um, it's a quieter place than the rest of this raucous campus where a lot of silliness and zaniness, zaniness are going on. Uh, one day, Graham was in the yurt with his two counselors, two brilliant, lovely, kind young women. Um, and they realized that Graham wanted to try to walk which was something that he struggled to do. He really never could do it very well. But once in a while, he could put one foot in front of another with help, with support, and take a few steps. And it gave him a lot of pride to, to do that. So they spent maybe a half an hour to 45 minutes, one on each arm, walking him around the perimeter of the yurt, um, painstakingly. And it was a huge effort by all three of them. Uh, but it was a Jabberwocky moment. It's the sort of thing that happens down there, an unexpected, whimsical thing. And when he completed that loop around the yurt, he, he looked up at Michelle, one of the two counselors, and a huge grin appeared on his face, followed by this just uninhibited, total body, wild laughter that came out of his, came out of his mouth. And the three of them looked at one another, um, and said, wow. And later on, when uh, Michelle related that incident to me, she told me that was the best moment of my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And oh, that, that's amazing. I can't even imagine the stories that you've got in there. Some other stories. What are some other stories? Because that was so inspirational. There's another story where um, a counselor named Kelsey is bathing in. And uh, she's wearing, uh, which is typical at camp, a mismatched bikini because 
people's clothes get lost in the laundry and nobody cares what they look like anyway. So she got a mismatched bikini on, she's, she's lathering him up for a shave, sitting behind him in the tub. And her co-counselor is alongside the tub with a sponge washing him. And they're sort of in there giggling. Uh, and by chance, Kelsey's mom uh, shows up that day to bring the counselors a goodie bag because they never have time to get stuff for themselves. Treats, you know, shampoo, cookies, candy, toothpaste. So her mom showed up and sort of cracked open the door to the cabin and observed this incredibly poignant sort of personal uh, scene hat playing out. And she saw her daughter there whistling while she was uh, lathering Graham up for a shave in this goofy outfit. And uh, she teared up and later on, she wrote me a letter and said that in that moment, she realized, uh, she realized who her daughter was. I think that it was a time when the daughter was about to embark on a college tour, a, a search for colleges. But the mom wrote me and said, you know, a lot of that doesn't really matter anymore because I, when I saw that scene play out in front of my eyes, I already realized who my daughter is. Well, and you know what, you bring up a really significant point in my mind about who we really are. I, I think so often, I know I'm, I'm trying to start to work with, with some, some folks that have experienced some real tough things in their lives and are coming out of a situation where they're not quite sure what to do and, and what their life is going to look like. <clears throat> and, and there's so much guilt and shame and, and things that have gone on there. And the reality is, I'm not sure that we all realize the goodness that is in each one of us. Yeah. And all it takes is something like that experience to recognize it. Yeah. I think in all the years that CAP has been in existence, uh, there's never been a single volunteer who walked away from there without saying that they got more out of it than they gave to it. So the, the notion of giving, uh, giving a part of ourselves is the one true gift. And maybe that's Ralph Waldo Emerson or someone like that. But when we give a portion of ourselves, that's the one true gift. And it boomerangs back around and, and it enriches us every time. Yes. And, and it doesn't have to be a Jabberwocky. It, it can be just a smile, a hug, whatever that happens to be to someone that seems to have that emotional need. So, so many people have been dealt with what they would say is a bad hand. They, they just, their life isn't what they wished it had been. Uh, they're frustrated, they're angry. How do they live life fully, regardless of those? And, and we're not talking about people who have become, you know, severely disabled or even, you know, reasonably disabled, but we're talking about in general. I was born in a situation that is not good. I, you know, I have I don't have parents or I'm homeless or whatever that has happens to be. What has been your experience and lessons learned on how do they live fully, regardless of whatever hand that they've been dealt? If they're lucky, you know, they'll run into somebody who's been to Camp Jabberwocky or one of its sister camps <laughs> or or they'll have a neighbor who, who gets that. Um, I found that, you know, paradoxically, when, when I feel poorly, uh, when I feel put upon or whatever, if I'm able to do even a small gesture for someone else, that always makes me feel better. So participating in whatever way in some small form of altruism or charity uh, to assist other people will always make people feel better. Uh, even people who are in rough shape themselves, um, trying to find other people that they can laugh with um, is therapeutic and cathartic. Um, we talked earlier about um, how important laughter is at Jabberwocky and silliness and whimsicality. And when those people get together, it sort of all bets are off. There's no political correctness involved. 
Um, so the more laughter, the better. And we, we take our silliness very seriously. So for people like the ones you're talking about, if they can somehow find a community in which they're encouraged uh, to laugh and be silly, um, to express themselves and not worry about offending anybody, that's a nice thing, but it, it, it's not available to ev everybody in that situation, unfortunately. So how do we help? How do we, as individuals who have the ability to do that, go in and help these communities, help these individuals? Uh, and, you know, I don't want to ask you the whole research on laughter, because that would be unfair. I've read a couple of things here and there, and I don't remember everything that I read. But, but you know, laughter, adventure. Um, I remember yeah. a couple of years ago, and, you know, particularly within the pandemic, um, you know, I'm, I was here home alone, and, you know, for, for almost a year. And one of the things I realized is I have got to get out and have adventure. I've got to overcome this emotional yeah. stuff that I'm experiencing and, and have adventure and have fun. Um, how can we bring that into the lives of those around us? And as you say, we can't necessarily go into some of these other communities, but I guarantee you our neighbor or one of our neighbors needs that. I've always loved uh, the expression from the Talmud that uh, whosoever saves even one life saves mankind entirely. And I would just, I mean, that's a dramatic statement. I would paraphrase that by saying, uh, whosoever can enrich even one life enriches mankind entirely. In other words, you and I can't fix the problems of 7 billion souls. Um, but even if, we, even if we assist one other human being and get them to laugh and get them moving in a more positive direction, in an ethereal way, that helps all, that helps all of mankind. Uh, I, I believe that's true. So I, I think that the, the experience of Jabberwocky, what's happened on Martha's Vineyard, has in effect been exported over the years from that island to wherever those people ended up around this country and elsewhere. And one would hope that they've, they've carried a bit of that spirit of altruism and silliness and love with them to the communities they come from and shared it with at least one other soul. Well, and, and I think as you've mentioned, feeling that sense of love isn't necessarily even by a touch, although that really helps. But even being, I'm sure, even being in Graham's presence, you could feel that yeah. sense of love. Yeah, almost like an aura around the guy. Um, in fact, I took some photographs over the years, which made me scratch my head because some of them actually looked as if there was a halo over his head. <laughs> um, they, were, they were probably, you know, artifacts of the printing process or something, but yeah. I, I interpreted them uh, a little differently. Um, uh, may I remark on the laughter research thing that you- Please, alluded? absolutely, please. I think there's some folks out at Stanford who are literally studying uh, the science beneath being silly and laughing and teasing, teasing people. And what I think they've discovered is that as we might expect, the feel good hormones tend to go up when people are laughing a lot. So things like endorphins, a, a hormone called oxytocin, which is known for going up during sex, by the way. Uh, and meanwhile, the stress hormone cortisol actually goes down. So uh, what they're really, th what they're saying is that when we're laughing a lot, it's very similar to exercising, meditating, and having sex all at the same time. So that's sort of a joke, <laughs> it's sort of a, sta a Stanford joke, but I think there's, a, I think there's something to that. Um, it's therapeutic to be silly. It's therapeutic to be whimsical and playful. It's therapeutic to tease each other and to laugh. And now we know there's a little bit of science underneath that. We already knew it was true, right? But, but now we kind of understand better what the science is. Well, and you know, I, I see this 
in different words, but this whole concept of love, laugh, live yeah. type of thing. And, and I think that, that that becomes such an important aspect to anyone's life if they can realize that if they can love, if they can laugh, they're going to live and and really experience a different life and and what i appreciate about your book and what i appreciate about what you're doing in the message is that you know you're saying hey just and i loved what you, the quote out of the talmud that you know just one affecting one life yeah. can affect many absolutely so what would be your message in today's environment what would be your message to the audience and in general the people of the world, based on your experiences with Graham and your experiences at Jabberwocky and in general, what would be your message to them? I believe that I'm going to paraphrase uh, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, an, a, another author. He said that, you know, we all have invisible lines of connection. And sometimes they're hard to decipher and hard to see. Um, but to me, what that really means is that we are all one human family. We're, we're divided up and we're polarized and a whole bunch of stuff right now. But at the end of the day, it's possible to think of us all as part of one community, one human family um, in which we're all equals. And the ones who can do a little bit more should do a little bit more. And the ones who need help deserve, deserve help. Um, and eventually those two camps sort of blend because in the end, we, we all kind of need help at some point. Yeah. Um, so I guess to try to answer your question succinctly, I would say it's just the notion that we all belong together. Um, we all belong to this one family that at times gets very fragmented, uh, but under the right circumstances, it can, it can be brought together in a way where our hearts and our minds are opened up to one another. And I suppose if we want to really experience something at a higher level, touch someone else's life. And I love what you said about that. That, that is kind of obtuse thinking, but the reality is, is, is if we can reach out and touch someone else's life, it's going to do something for us. Indeed, absolutely, yeah. Well, Dr. Steve, what a wonderful message. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, just amazing. And, and what wonderful experiences and a willingness to share those experiences with, particularly in your book and, and with people in general. Uh, I can tell you, I really appreciate it. It's been, my, it's been a pleasure and it's been wonderful to hear feedback from people who might have struggled with some of the issues that you brought up today and who felt that Graham's story assisted them a little bit in under, understanding better. Uh, what it what it meant to them well and absolutely and and the stories of people's lives can make such a difference if they're willing to share it and oftentimes people aren't willing to share that so your transparency your your willingness to share that is is amazing and certainly major kudos to you so dr steve thanks so much for being on the show dr doug thank you for having me on really appreciate it folks thanks for listening I know you enjoyed this. Where do they find your book? Jabberwockybook.com. That's all they need to know. It's available everywhere and it's ex explained on the website. So uh, one word, jabberwockybook.com. And that is spelled J-A-B-B-E-R-W-O-C-K-Y. Exactly. Dot com. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs> Pleasure, Doug. Keep up the good work. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Folks, thanks for listening. Hope you'll join us again soon. Take care.